to start. Um, we're going to start off with some intros here, so we'll do this really quick. Hi, I'm Sarah Terrell. I'm a project manager at Tenup. Tenup has 115, I think, employees, and we're always hiring, so, you know, if you're looking for a job. And I think on the website now there's a finder's fee for 500 bucks if you know any project managers looking for jobs. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, my name's Ian. Um, I'm a WordPress developer. Um, front-end developer at um, Alley Interactive, a big media agency, um, and I've uh, been doing this for uh, a long time, since like tables were a thing, which is like two years, right? That's, yeah. Hi, my name is Amy CQ, and I help solo openers play big while staying small. Uh, my website is hugish.com, and I help other solo openers with their branding, their websites, and with consulting. And my name is John Bishop. I'm a director of technology at AMP Agency, a full-service marketing agency here in Boston. I've been doing WordPress for a long time and technology for a little bit longer, so it should be fun. My name is Mary Beth Murphy. <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Aaron Ware. I'm actually the owner of Lynchman Agency. Um, we're a full-service creative agency based in Little Roadie, um, and we're actually actively involved in the WordPress community down there. So check us out at the local uh, WordPress Rhode Island meetups as well. So I'll start with the first question, and it's one that I have for you guys, and it's about scoping and projects. Um, when you get a new project in, how do you gather all of the information that you need to then determine who's on the team, what pieces do we need, how do we estimate it, and there's a ton there, but um, it's always something that's interesting, and I think it differs from agency to agency and person to person, so if anyone want to tackle that to get us started? So one of the big challenges we have, we're not a huge team. We're a team of 11, just recently, we, we got up to 11. And one of the big challenges we have is, we don't always have enterprise level clients that have a huge RFP. So we don't necessarily understand the scope of a project if it's just someone coming in, just a referral. Um, so a big part of our process is really um, edging, educating the client, the potential client on needs, and also understanding how they can get to market with whatever they want to do. We do a lot of WordPress development, that's why we're all here. And sometimes a client may have a very small budget but have a lot of needs. So we try and figure out what can be done short term to get a project live um, and establish like, goals. And then also what are uh, you know, kind of wants and, and good to have sort of things. And that's really our, our first step. Um, from there, we really try to make sure that key stakeholders from uh, the client's perspective, whether that be the, the initial person who made contact, but that, per, that initial person may not be the, the, the end decider of how money gets spent from a marketing or operational standpoint. So we try and make sure we know what key stakeholders should be on their end, and then also on our end, from a technical standpoint, what developers should be there, uh, from the creative standpoint, either it's Mary Beth, who's our, our senior designer, our lead designer, maybe a creative director. And then from there, again, we're small, so um, Jennifer, who is on our team, who's our senior client coordinator, she is there as well, just to make sure we can get an understanding, of, at least a preliminary sense, of what that project will entail. That allows us to kind of go back internally after we have maybe an initial kickoff call um, or a face-to-face -face meeting and figure out what our scope will be for an estimate to really define what our proposal should be. It, it's a little bit of upfront investment from our time standpoint, but it's really helped alleviate a lot of the process moving forward and giving a client an understanding of what we're actually delivering to them. So yeah, we, we do it pretty similarly. Um, I think the main thing is uh, we, we try and scope out uh, high level pieces of functionality uh, that we can 
wrap our minds around in, in the sense of the weeks, because we, we really don't know uh, what it's going to look like, what the exact functionality is going to be. We really just have a couple goals that the client needs to meet um, and whatever other reasons they have for creating the site. So taking that into account, we do our best to, um, I, I just find weeks easier to work with because it gives us flexibility to be uh, over or under a little bit. Um, just encapsulate those larger pieces of functionality and then we're really selling the process. Uh, just everything from brand strategy, UX, uh, creative and development, how we work together, um, and how we can get the client from their original vision to the end site uh, without having to give them anything too specific up front. Um, because I think that's where miscommunication early can negatively affect us later. Um, if we get too far down the line and we're in the development phase and we're building a piece of functionality, they completely envisioned a different way, um, then we're, we're stuck. Uh, so we try to keep it as high level as possible in the beginning, um, think about it in a sense of weeks, uh, which gives us a little flexibility, um, and really enforcing a uh, process so that they understand the process we go through, where they get involved, um, where they get to provide feedback, um, and, that, and that's really helped us a lot. Okay, so I'm going to maybe do a little bit different take because, again, I'm working by myself, so it's just me. And that takes a lot of time. It does. And while I do have steps where I get a lot more client feedback and things, I actually restructured my business offerings completely so that there were more packaged options for people to see. Because I also work with a lot of other solo openers like myself. And to do that saved me time from a lot of custom estimates, quotes, proposals, and things. Because that took a lot of my time for something that I wasn't even sure I'd get or even in their ballpark of what they wanted to spend. So I, I think it takes some time to kind of develop those, and it'll probably be continually tweaking those packages to say, okay, maybe it should be this, or how long, or this price. But I found that doing it in that way, they have something to look at. I can give them a landing page. They, get, they can see my process, the features, and the price. And then it says, and we, you know, I can go custom uh, functions or if you need more print work or something like that we can talk then after that that's kind of my qualification zone and that's what I give them first if they pass the test on that then we usually set up a phone call and we get into more of their their goals what are they looking for um, what package were they looking at you know what customizations maybe they need and kind of get more into the specifics but I use those packages kind of as a, a, a gateway before they talk to me Um, well, uh, I was going to say, uh, usually when stuff gets to me, um, I'm a front-end developer, so stuff has already gone through a process where there's, there's deliverable schedule, there's a milestone document and stuff, and um, when I start the development process, something we've been doing for the past about a year or so has been to kind of come up with a theme inventory, which um, has been really helpful for me because it kind of creates a canonical like document of just, just uh, all the design files we have, what needs to be built, how it needs to look, and if there's any kind of conflict between versioning and stuff like that, we've been using this as kind of like just the guide to like what is due and what it should look like. So that's something that I really haven't seen in other companies um, we've been using for the past year. So it's been pretty helpful for front end work anyway. So and I think something like that maybe for for you know scope for back end development. I don't know if anyone uses that, but it's been helpful for me. So kind of a little bit bigger, and it's grown over the last few years. Um, now we have an accounts team, and they do a lot of the initial sort of talking to a potential client and what might you be looking for and would you be a good fit for 10 up and that sort of thing. So um, they do a lot of that initial work, which is awesome. Um, and then it comes to a pod, which is a team. There are eight of them at 10 up. I'm on the A team. Um, I've previously served on Keyboards of Fire and Serenity teams, which are also fun. Um, and from there, uh, there's a lot of process that goes on. But I think that it ends up being a much better product because of it. Um, we have director touch points, so there's a layer of directors that's the UX director, a systems director, a director of engineering, and those sorts of things. So at every phase of the project, those directors are coming in and talking with the project team to make sure that everything is sort of meeting 10 up standards and everything's on time and the UX looks good and it's where the client needs to be and all that other stuff. So 10 up has a lot of process because we're a big agency. 
but it certainly has helped streamline the process as well and make it a really good experience for the customer. I'm going to ask a follow-up and then maybe, maybe one more and then we'll open that up so you guys be thinking of questions. Um, and this would be a good one uh, to start with you, Sarah, because I know one up, uh, ten up, sorry. Uh, <laughs> seven up. <laughs> I know you guys have a huge, huge team and um, uh, you guys are, are basically everywhere. Um, I know through process, at least my process, working with my clients, it, it can be very difficult and challenging communicating with when it's me talking to one person, how do you guys manage the teams when you guys are all over the world? And I know you said you work in smaller teams, but how do you do that as far as um, like the ways you guys communicate internally with yourself and the client? So we have lots of different tools that we use. Um, HipChat is very popular, and so we use that for sort of chatting all day, every day, throughout the day. There tends to be a morning shift and a night shift, depending on time zone you're in, we have people all over the world, so there tends to always be somebody online and talking through HipChat. Um, we use Google Docs for a lot of stuff. We used to use ha Google Hangouts as well, but we've shifted away and now we're using a product called Zoom, and we do a lot of video hangouts that way, um, both internally and with clients. Um, we do video where possible, it's also got a dial-in number, so some people just dial in, it works internationally, so that's awesome for us. Um, what about with clients? clients. Sorry. What about with clients? Sorry, clients. Um, with clients, we are fairly flexible. Um, we usually use Basecamp for project management, but we'll also use Jira um, or any other sort of project management software that, that the client tends to use. Um, with some clients, we use Slack, and so they'll create a Slack channel, channel that will communicate with them in the live, real time, which is handy for them. Um, I think we have any that are in our internal hip chat, which is probably better because that would maybe cause awkwardness later on. But, um, and you know, email for some of the slower or not as fast moving clients. But um, we're pretty flexible and we use almost any piece of software that, that the client wants to use. Anyone else want to add? Yeah, sure. Strategies for communicating internally well? Yeah, the so. Process? Um, uh, because I'm at a full service agency, I don't have a lot of direct interaction with the client, except for some of the initial phases, and usually toward the end a little bit. Um, we have an entire account team that, that manages that, um, and that's still pretty traditional. Um, I'd like for it to be a bit more cutting edge, but it's still very traditional. Um, uh, internally, uh, so technically I sit, uh, the technology team sits within the creative team at AVA Agency, and uh, we, we call ourselves creative technologists. Uh, the idea being, we just wanted to work work closely together. We wanted to innovate together. Um, we wanted to just be smart when it came to websites. So we also use HipChat. Um, we rely on, on it heavily. We have two rooms that we most uh, use most regularly: the interactive room, and we have the creator active room, which is kind of the, the both of us working together. Um, I think it's also important to kind of like literally be close in proximity um, when, when you're working on projects. So like our creative team is literally blended with our technology team. Uh, we sit pretty much right next to each other, so uh, nerf darts meant for the, the creative team will often hit us. Um, but uh, that, that's, that alone has been helpful. Uh, and some of the things we're trying to do is that there are a lot of kind of isolated efforts uh, around just innovation. Uh, and a lot of that, it goes uncaptured. Because um, it's two people that's next to each other just talking about technologies they find interesting or uh, design patterns that they think are cool, and a lot of that kind of one-to-one -one in emails and stuff. So we're, we're trying to figure out a process internally for collaborating and sharing that information so that there's a central channel for us to share that innovative new technology so everyone can look back and discuss that technology and understand it. And there's a central place for that conversation. Um, and that's my kind of pet project internally right now that I think, that I think will help us a lot with communication. Um, other than that, our project managers are literally the glue uh, at AMP that kind of make everything work. Uh, they're, they're very um, uh, they're very specific in everything that they do, uh, some, some more than others, but everything's very, very detailed as far as the functionality, uh, what's, what the client should expect, uh, when things are due. Uh, timelines are very strict. We do uh, weekly resourcing where we look back at the previous week and the next week to figure out uh, is everything going to get done on time. And it's that kind of ongoing optimization of the team and who's working on what 
and trying to figure out how we work more efficiently internally and literally getting used to getting up and walking over and, and checking out the progress of someone else's work. And that's something that mentally has been hard for us because uh, as technologists, I find it a lot easier to walk over and look over my coworker's shoulder and see what he's working on because I'm, I'm more sincerely interested. Um, but I find sometimes creatives tend to get a little bit more, uh, like, I'm not done yet, don't look at it. So uh, <laughs> try, trying to get over that, that hump has been a little tough, um, but I think we're getting over it. I think it's an important one to get over. Uh, we have to kind of put our pride aside and, and work, work collaboratively uh, to really get, get there faster um, and innovate faster. Yeah. So that's been big for us. What I'll do is I'll lead in on some communication and get to, I think, a really strong point that Mary Beth will expand upon. So from, from a client-facing standpoint, we're very flexible. Whether it's a, a phone call, a Slack room, hip chat room, we actually do open up some guest access to our hip chat um, rooms, but it's very specific to some of our clients. Uh, maybe they have their own um, IT department or marketing department that are savvy that can get into our, um, our hip chat rooms. We have some clients that um, we do some Magento stuff, um, and we've actually written like uh, controls using. If you're familiar with uh, uh, HipChat, uh, there's uh, Git, GitHub actually created a, a little like bot called Hubot that actually can run scripts. Uh, we've actually created uh, our own custom scripts for some of our clients to interact with their installs. So, um, in a Magento standpoint, sometimes. Uh, Varnish cache needs to be cleared after like updating like a product. Uh, so we actually allow them through like hip chat to actually run certain basic commands that normally they would have to like maybe get into a server and know, or maybe they get into the WordPress admin. So we've done some controls, but that's like a technical thing. But from a communication standpoint, we're very flexible um, in, in that scenario. We try to actually get clients away from emails um, and try and get them into more actionable items because then we're just taking an email then making a JIRA issue or, you know, we're trying to get rid of that busy work. We're trying to keep it more streamlined. Internally, we primarily communicate through four real areas. One is hip chat. Our chat rooms, we're in there. I, granted, we, we work very distributed, but we're really actually all together. We work out of one office, but we use a lot of like tools that are powerful in distributed companies like like 10 up and, and like automatic, you know, those types of companies. So HipChat primarily for internal communication, but on top of that, it, it expands further. When we have issues, we can reference those issues from our JIRA instance within HipChat. So we can mention a task and get details about that task within HipChat. In, again, internally expanding upon that, we have a wiki that is intertwined. So there's communication about deliverables and what people need um, from a handoff from a creative team to the development team there's a lot of information that's there in our, our wiki about you know style guides and hex values they need you know font declarations if the the type kit uh, uh, kit has actually been created we kind of share all those things and Mary Beth will expand upon that process a little bit um, and then all the way down to our commit messages so when we commit our code, we're um, referencing back to our, our JIRA issues, we're referencing back to um, bite-sized pieces, so all that communication that has happened, whether it's a, a hip chat communication, an issue within JIRA, from our knowledge base, our wiki, all the way to our commits, there's always some referenceable ID, typically an issue, um, that everyone can go back to. And then we know we have that dialogue in some way, shape, or form. And that helps everybody know in all different avenues of the company what's really going on and can reference back to it if they don't want to get into the minutia at the time. Uh, but Mary Beth can actually share some, some of the things we do from a design to dev standpoint. Happy. <laughs> um, yeah, so from the very beginning, the get-go of our design, um, you know, Aaron mentioned that we work Distributed. We're kind of doing our own thing on our own teams, even though we're side by side. But um, I think we work really collaboratively with each other as well. Um, you know, from the very beginning, we're going back and forth with the development team, um, making sure that we're not out of scope on anything, um, that we're keeping within the 
original plan of the project, um, that we don't have any crazy features. Um, if we have some, as Aaron likes to call it, whiz bangy thing, awesome design transition or animation, um, that's something that is achievable and um, that our dev team can handle, or you know, maybe it's something that they've done before that they can re-implement and repurpose. Um, so all throughout the design process, we work pretty closely with the development team, making sure that um, you know, it's not anything out of scope. Uh, from there, once the project's been approved by the client, we're good to go, ready to ship it over to the development team. Um, we work super hard in um, pretty much packaging up the entire project as if our own team wasn't even developing it. Um, you know, any screens for the site that we've created, um, we'll put up in our wiki that Aaron mentioned, um, which is like a shared space. Um, every single project will have its own wiki page with its own, you know, setup of screens. Um, we put detailed notes in there for every single page that we've mocked up for the site. Even pages that we haven't mocked up, you know, if it's just like a template or something, um, you know, we'll make really specific notes for the development team so they know what they're building, how they're building it. Um, we'll export any assets, images. Um, we use icon fonts for all of our icons. Um, fonts, you know, you name it. Pretty much anything that the de development team could need, we package it up so that we can just ship it off to them and they can kind of run with it. Um, once we have everything pretty much exported, ready to go for them, we sit down with them and we go through the whole site and we make sure that there's a clear understanding of what's going to happen. Um, and I think that's super important because without that, you know, there could be some miscommunication. And we want to make sure that they have everything that they need and that there's nothing, you know, mis no misunderstandings, nothing that's going to come out of the project that the client's expecting and not getting. Um, or something that the design team's expecting and the development team wasn't aware of. Um, so I think in that sense, we do a really great job of you know, going through what needs to be done. Um, but at the same time, it's super efficient. You know, I'm making it sound like it's this big, long process, but um, it's actually like you know, a matter of one day. We get everything packaged up, um, all documented for the development team, all assets um, posted up in, in our wiki or an up on Dropbox, and um, that way anyone can access it. If someone's working remotely or if someone's not in the office, pretty much everything's there, all the notes they need um, to kind of get started on the build. So um, it's a process that we take pride in and we're always trying to make it better and improve on it, but you know, every project we get a little better. And what is, what is, so what does packaged mean, like to us? Like what assets do you have to create? Um, so fonts, what else? So fonts, images, um, colors. I mean, I guess that's kind of weird, but you know, there might be like a style guide. We actually do create a style guide um, to define colors. Um, we a new thing that we kind of started doing in our process is making more digital or development friendly style guides. I guess so, helping to define like H1, H2s, P tags, etc. Um, just to kind of take away some of the back and forth. QA on type styling, um, that sort of thing. Um, I don't know what other deliverables would be, like logos, any image assets, um, which we'll export you know, at double the size so that they're, they look nice on Retina and across all devices. Um, no Photoshop files at all. No. So like I said, it's kind of like we're putting together all of these assets and handing them off to someone that we don't even work with, but in reality, we're just like sitting right next to each other and <laughs> Here you go, guys. It's all set. Um, but it's kind of nice because they don't have to open up a Photoshop file and dig through the layers and figure out all this stuff on their own. Um, we've defined it for them, and it's all set. Um, you know, we export out JPEGs. No PSDs. No. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Do you guys have anything like that? Do you guys try and like, like as a bigger team? You know, at Ten Up, do you have something similar where designers like are handing off ready-made assets like we do? It varies. Um, so our our pods are made up generally of a, there's often a designer or a front-end engineer on the pod along with developers, their project manager, um, sometimes a UX person or a systems engineer. So they're all on the same pod together. So it's not necessarily like we would hand it off. They're kind of working in conjunction at the same time. Some projects we do the designs and some projects we have a client that's giving designs to us, which might mean PSDs and might mean that we have to go and find the colors and all that annoying stuff, but it really varies from project to 
project, um, but our pods are more, are not like designers and then developers, they're all in one team. Yeah, yeah I think ours are too, I think that that's something that, from our process, can you guys hear me, do I even need a mic? For the video. Oh, for the yes. video, okay. I, I think that it's one thing that, uh, again, that the team thing actually is something that, uh, again, when we say it's distributed, I think because we could work very distributed. And I think that the one thing that has helped our process evolve from, you know, handing off, you know, image assets uh, as, as they're intended, it's to actually make sure that the designers and the client is actually getting what is intended. And sometimes there is... Uh, there's a bad translation that happens when a Photoshop file is handed off. I, I think one of the big things that we always had a struggle with was uh, <laughs> Photoshop files that are really unorganized, and that was <coughs> always a sticking point, especially with me, was I didn't understand what layers should be turned on. Even if there were layer comps, even if there were all these things, it was really hard to understand what should be shown, and we actually had it come up in QA all the time of like, oh, I had this layer on, I didn't realize that that was a mock-up, I didn't realize that was an improved thing. And then once we had our designers export out what, yeah, I hate to say it, even though we try and get away from slideshows, what slideshow image should this be? And just as if a client wanted to upload an image themselves, what, what is that supposed to be? And that's really helped us from a QA standpoint more than, more than anything, and it's, for every process we have that's terrible, like personally our deployment process is awful, it, but we try and get better at it. Our design process, I feel is like revolutionary in terms of agency life. What's the you guys use? Well, we're so in bed with, I didn't want to say like at lazy and stuff, but we use Confluence. What? Yeah, Confluence, <laughs> HipChat, Jira, we use Service Desk. We're so in bed, like we tried Slack, and we use Slack for some of our clients and we loved it. And then it was a matter of, oh, we can get Jira issues like really easy. Yeah, all of a sudden now we're in bed with them, sadly. Oh, so it's so expensive though. I wish I could get like a promo code. <laughs> we can open it up here. I'll be the runner. Okay. <laughs> hey guys, uh, <clears throat> my name is uh, Christian. I work for Pressable, uh, the managed worker. So I said, this question is kind of twofold. The one, um, you almost kind of got there about the development. How do you guys uh, deal with the actual uh, making, of, making of the code, uh, showing it to customers? You guys de uh, develop locally and then push out? Um, do you guys go straight to where it's going to be? Um, and when it comes to finding, and, and this is more like for my information, but maybe other people won't care, but maybe we can talk about it a little bit later. But when you guys are considering the host, you guys always have like somebody you guys always go with. Um, and if you like, if you rather control that yourself or just set up the customer, and then once the project is done, you set it off. Okay, so if I can remember both parts. So for hosting, um, we're generally hosting agnostic, so it depends on the needs of the client. So usually that's a conversation that we have during discovery. What do you need for hosting? Does it need to be self-hosted? Do you need a full support thing? How big is it going to be? How much traffic are you expecting? All that kind of stuff. And then we make recommendations based on that. Sometimes they come to us, they're already using a hosting provider, and so then we'll talk about, are you happy with your hosting provider? That kind of stuff. So um, we use a lot of different ones. We work with BIP a lot. We work with WP Engine a lot. We work with CenturyLink a lot. But we work with a lot of different ones depending on who we're working with. First part of your question? The development. Development. Right. Um, so we use Beanstalk, um, so with every project we set up a staging environment and so then we are using Git and we're pushing things up to Beanstalk. Most of our developers use a local and then they push up to the master. Um, when we're ready, we will let the client in and, and see that staging environment and then usually we'll then push that up to the hosting provider when it's time for launch. Uh, we actually at Ali have a great process um, for, for this. We use um, primarily uh, Pantheon for hosting sites. We, we do some other variations on there, but they have a, a feature where um, when you branch out from master on GitHub, you can actually have uh, different instances running. So you can have your staging and your um, development branches running as their own servers on there, so um, or their own sites. So we'll have uh, like an internal preview, we'll have a, like a client-facing preview, and then we have the production site. 
and that's all managed through, I mean, we have a Vagrant install we've customized, um, we use that. We use GitHub, we use Pantheon, it's, it's a pretty straightforward, simple process, so. From a development standpoint, um, yeah, ours is always evolving. Um, we have uh, new front-end developers and, and seasoned front-end developers, and one of the challenges we've actually had is automating our deployment strategy. So we use WP Engine a lot. We have some other hosting providers. We're, we're pretty agnostic to clients if they have their own hosting or they have their own teams that manage stuff. We try and work within, we give them, you know, we're a WordPress shop, so obviously it has to have a Linux stack, Nginx, whatever you want to do. Uh, but something we're trying to get better about is automation for our deployments. Uh, I'm a big fan of CodeShip, so CodeShip.io. Um, I, I think it, it's very easy to get uh, started with. It's very similar to something like Beanstalk. Uh, I think Beanstalk has even a standalone now, so if you don't want to use their repos, you can actually have a standalone. Um, we're actually evolving from our, our Git process from something we snagged from Matt over at Alley. You know, they actually do a very good job of, you know, branching for features within their Git repo. So we used to uh, have a really bad process where we'd work like out of a develop branch and we would just make changes, everyone would commit to develop, and then basically someone was typically in charge, either myself or John, who's our senior engineer, would be involved in merging develop into master. Um, and primarily because there was one person that was like the gatekeeper from develop to master, it was relatively easy. But it was a nightmare when it came to bite-sized pieces of code. And when we started to <coughs> implement uh, making feature branches or hotfixes as just individual bite-sized branches and doing pull requests, it actually really helped with having peer review. And that's something we're just starting to get into that Ali actually has a huge amount of experience with. Um, and again, it's something that, that Matt and you know Ian, he probably knows a boatload about it um, and can share more. Uh, but it's something we're just starting to get into and that's really helped um, from uh, just a QA standpoint. Um, very similar experiences, I think, for all of us. Uh, something specifically that wasn't mentioned that helps us a lot is just uh, some our task automation processes. So we, we use Grunt. Um, we have uh, a, a few frameworks we like. Uh, we use Foundation a lot. So we have uh, our, our kind of standard Foundation boilerplate that has our kind of Grunt setup that we're familiar with, they're all comfortable with. Um, that handles just the basic things uh, like um, you know, CSS or the SAS uh, processing and uh, JavaScript unification. Um, we don't take it much farther than that. And then. Uh, I think our Git strategy is pretty, all pretty similar. It's, it's not as uh, robust as we'd like it to be, I, I like what Ian's talking about. Um, we, uh, we try to do auto-deployment to our staging servers. If not, we have to do it manually, and then we kind of we push manually to live uh, when we need it. So it's still very manual, but our projects are very drastic because we're not a WordPress shop. Um, we're a full service marketing agency, so we do a little bit of everything. Um, so it's, it's hard to come up with that one process that'll work for everything. Um, but so for that reason, we, uh, we use AWS uh, because it has a little bit of everything. Um, so uh, we mostly go back to that, but we've used Rackspace and Azure in the past, and uh, we do host elsewhere. It really is uh, you know, the client's needs first, and then our processes kind of fit in there around that. I was just going to add, it might not totally answer your question, but I mean, I agree. Everything up here, I think very similar. I have a very similar take, maybe just on a smaller scale. But also, and kind of related to, especially you know on the design end, is naming conventions. Like it's just the thing, like that version control. Like in, in that print world, the design end of things, you also need to have some kind of version control there. So like coming up with a naming convention of your file, filing system on your computer so that you know, like, okay, this is the revision I sent them here. This is how I'm gonna name it. Are you using V1 or R1 or? Whatever one or two or three, that definitely helps. I know myself to know where everything is and what stage that I gave it to. Them, where I'm at. Uh, was that was that Matt Boynes you were talking about? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, this guy, uh, Matt Boynes, is a he's a partner at Alley. Um, he actually gave a talk, uh, big media meetup, I think, um, about our. our um, Sorry, I stole it. Yeah, yeah, about our, our code review process. Uh, one of the things I left out in like kind of more nitty gritty detail.
details. Um, it's between the uh, like the client-facing preview and actual production is that uh, we submit pull requests through GitHub and that other people in the company look at that code. So it's, it's peer-reviewed by another developer. And it's actually been incredible for me because I'm seeing other work that other people do. And I'm learning lots of stuff like about their, their techniques, you know, and I'm, I'm actually learning a lot from other code because I get to I get to look at it. But we all check out each other's code and it's kind of like, you know, if you approve that, it's like you might as well have wrote it so you're both in trouble if something goes wrong. So. But no, the, uh, look up Matt Boynes if you're interested in that. It's, 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 a, it's, yeah. it's a really good process. I'm a big, huge fan of it. So he's really evangelical about it too. So. No, I'm good. I already answered your question. I thought so. Who else? Anyone? Questions? Questions? If not, I'm going into my own. Going once, going twice. An iPhone. Um, I heard you guys talk a little bit about um, how you present things to the client. I know one of the things that um, we struggle with is like wireframing, and then you know determining, hey, this is how this functions. How do you guys handle the wireframing part within each of your companies and how you work? Elaborate, okay. Mary Beth. <laughs> yeah, so we actually recently kind of reworked how we um, present our wireframes. Um, after we kind of have an initial content strategy, a site map, um, a general idea of what direction we're going in, um, we'll get started on wireframes. And we used to make them, I guess, a little more detailed. Um, we would use Lorem of some font for any copy and. Um, I don't know, we would put some more information in there than what was really needed, because at this point it's really just a blueprint. We're just trying to get our idea of what the layout is across to the client. Um, so we really stripped it down, and instead of using any type or anything super detailed, we came up with, um, we kind of made like a set of graphics that we use. Um, so we have a graphic that represents an image. We have a gra graphic that represents a drop down or a button. Um, and then we have, we'll just have blocks of, or like shapes, I guess, to represent copy. Instead of really defining those at that early stage, um, and we think it kind of helps the client understand what we're trying to show without getting too detailed. A lot of times the client gets too caught up in those little things, um, especially content-wise. So we didn't want to mislead them in any way at that early part. Um, I don't know if that's really answering your question. What but. about um, like static? Wireframes sure. versus live. How do you yep. how do you handle that? Um, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we post up all of our wireframes designs. Um, anything we're going to present to the client, we use Envision app for. I don't know if anyone here has heard of it. It's free. It's super cool. Um, the base level is free. I should say you're only allowed so many projects with it, which we. We used the free le free level for a while. And finally, we decided we needed to uh, we needed to get a subscription there. But um, so we use a vision. We post up our screens, just static screens for wireframes, um, static screens for um, even designed up pages. But the nice thing about Envision is that not only can you select it's a desktop mockup or it's a mobile mockup or a tablet mockup, it'll put it in the device for you if it's a mobile mockup or a tablet. Um, you can actually view it on your phone, in your hand. It's super cool. You can um, you can create a fixed header. So you can show the client, oh, this is going to be fixed at the top of the page. You can create click-throughs. Um, so it's super easy to manipulate and show those simple animations to click through some screens. Even at the wireframing stage, we start thinking about that. Um, you know, is the header going to be fixed? Is it is it going to be a full browser with design? That sort of thing. Um, additionally, as we move through to de the design phase, we'll actually mock up like animated prototypes. Um, we'll use, I think we use Animate Edge or something fancy. I don't do them personally, so I can't speak on the other designers we have. But um, yeah, we create, we'll create um, actual prototypes of what an animation may look like. Um, it's not the actual code that we're going to use at the end of the day, but it's a quick way to show the client how something's going to animate. If it's a page transition, or how a slider is going to work, or you know, like I mentioned earlier, the fixed header. We do a lot of, not a lot, but recently we've done quite a few sites where you know, as you scroll down the page, the header kind of animates into place or something cool. Um, so just little things like that. I think it helps. Um, I don't want to say sell the client on the idea, but. Um, I think it kind of makes 
makes it a little special. It makes it more custom. Um, and again, showing them in real life um, is better than just showing them a static mock-up because then they can really understand what it's going to look like at the end of the day. So I kind of alluded to this earlier. Um, so early on in the process, I like to keep things very, very high level um, so that by the time we get to the wireframes phase, we're, we're not we're not getting into any kind of design treatment or even uh, what, what functionality could be like. And it's literally uh, working with the client to figure out the different types of users using the site and the different user journeys they're going to take throughout the site. So it's more about the, the site architecture and then the flow of content on the page um, and literally just where things are going to live. Um, and then maybe along with, along with that, provide something like style tiles uh, to give them a couple ideas of, of what the site could look like. And the main reason I want to do that is, is because later on, as we become more familiar with the project, and you know, we, we'll, we'll do our, our two weeks of research up front, working with like a dedicated brand strategy team, and they're pulling, they're doing like proprietary research, and um, even still, like a month or two in, we'll have some revelation, or we'll really, you know, understand some unique part of the business, um, and, that, and that insight we'll want to be able to react to. So a, a lot of the, the specifics about you know how the site's going to look and function, and what actually ends up there. It uh, doesn't come until a lot later. That's something we work very closely with our account team to, uh, to kind of iron out those details, run that stuff by the client, and then implement it. So I'm very, very opinionated internally. Anytime I see stuff in wireframes that, that gets too specific, like if there's a slider with the image on the right and the text on the left, it's like, get rid of that. Make it just a giant thing goes there. Um, and that, that's what I'm really looking for. And what purpose does that thing serve, really, uh, rather than just throwing a slider there? Um, What's a slider? We, don't even get me started. <laughs> so I was actually just—I was going to start going down that road because, like, we might one of the designs might have a slider in it, but we might find there's a better way to get that idea across, oh. especially if it's supposed to be a call to action. Like, maybe, maybe, maybe it's a photographer and he's showing up with his photos. There's one. Maybe. Anyone else have another? No. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I was going to add to that. That is going to sound probably. A horrible at first, but I found that using PowerPoint or Keynote is really useful when doing those really low fi wireframes because it's super restrictive. I'm not tempted to try to design anything and make it look nice. And it's car I'm kind of going into it knowing that and the client kind of knows, oh, this is in Keynote, so it shouldn't be designed anyway. So it kind of alleviates that because if I find myself trying to use something that has a little bit more functions and customs, I'm tempted to start to go, well, what color could this be? And what <laughs> font would this look like? And I'm like, no, 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 we're not going there yet. So even something like that, that gives them some interactivity still. You can still have clickable areas and sliding in some transitions and things, kind of give them a little sense of what it's going to be like. But because the software itself is so restricted, helps me to keep it very minimal. And I only use like black and white and grayscale and those, no color. I don't, I don't work with wireframes too much because I'm on the front end of the person. <laughs> All right, well. I, I, think your, I think your approach to design though actually well, yeah, I mean, I was, I was going to see if I could just speak on that for a second, so. Please. Yeah. All right. Um, so one of the things we've adopted um, at Alley recently, at, at least for, like, stuff that's coming from our internal design team, because we can, we can do this um, a little bit easier, is we kind of have more of, like, a waterfall process. So uh, as soon as wireframes are done, I get those. I do layouts in browser. And then as soon as, you know, like, the more kind of complex modules are done, I'll do those in a living style guide, which um, is kind of like a really modular uh, version of your style sheet um, that you can kind of preview just individual components like buttons or links or callouts. Um, and then at that point, I mean, you know, the client's still working out QA with the designer. Um, and I already have about two thirds of the styles ready to go. So as soon as the, uh, the final comps are done, I can just put the components in from the living style guide into my layouts and, and it's the finished product. So, so it's like a new thing we've been, we've been experimenting with at, at Alley for stuff that's going through our internal uh, design team. And, Huge fan of it, so and that's awesome. <laughs> if, if not, I don't have a lot to add. We use Envision a lot, and Mary Beth already sold that very well. And, <laughs> um, we use some sort of living style guides on some things as well, too. So that's also awesome. It comes up there. Well, we are coming to a conclusion here, as you heard the clapping next door. And how would a big uh, round of applause for everyone here? Who took the time out of their day to uh, do some, some
for last minute replacement. So thank you all for uh, for coming. Thank you for for sitting on the panel. And if you have other questions, come find us. I'm sure we'll have answers. Thank you. Uh, this um, it's gonna depend.